Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Saturday evening slash Sunday morning service here at Woo! Heartland Church. And uh, we're going to start singing here in just a moment. Uh, there's song sheets that have been passed out. If you need one, raise your hand. Katie will bring one of those around to you. And also communion cups have been distributed. So if you need communion cups, keep your hand up. And uh, I believe Ted has those. So uh, we'll get those around. And uh, let's stand. We're going to sing How Majestic Is Your Name. He's mighty, he's mighty, he's mighty, he's mighty, so mighty, he's mighty. 
welcome everyone to our service here this weekend for Heartland Church. And uh, just great to have everyone here in person, uh, just sitting out on the lawn and just worshiping our great God. And we do serve an awesome God. Amen. He is awesome. And uh, we sang about that just now. But, uh, you know, sometimes we just have to stop what we're doing, just tune everything else out, tune out the, the lawn care that we got to do, tune yep. out the dishes, whatever it is that you got to do this weekend, tune all that out and just worship our awesome God. Amen. And, um, you know, he's bigger than anything we face. He's bigger than anything this world has ever faced. He's bigger than anything that's going to come down the pike. And we got to remember that. He's watching over us. He's not going to let anything happen to you that he's not using for your good. Right. Right? We go through trials, and we're all, we all have an expiration date even. <laughs> but God's not going to let anything happen until he's ready to bring you home. And anything that happens to you on this earth, it's only because God is allowing you to go through that to grow or to help others. Amen? Amen. So Crystal's going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing another song, and then Josh has the word for us tonight. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just praise your holy name, God. We praise you for being so awesome for being our protector, God, our provider, Father, our comforter, our healer. God, we are so grateful just to be able to worship you and uh, just call on your name, God, any time of the day, Father. We love you so much, Father. We're so grateful for Jesus, God. Thank you for the spirit that you give us. Just thank you for it being everything that you are, God, for watching over us, God, for looking after us, for loving us, and putting so much thought into each one of us, God. We love you and pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.
Uh, to get to share with you guys this evening or whatever time of day you happen to be observing this. Uh, it's, it's just a, a great day to, to be together, a great day to, to worship God. Amen? Amen? And, you know, we just finished our uh, series on the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, and if you missed that series, it was awesome. Uh, we were focused on so much of who we need to be rather than what we need to do. Amen? Right. It's all too often that we, we focus on, on the things that we need to do, and yet we forget about our own heart. Uh, we forget about who we need to be for God. And, you know, I was thinking maybe we could just do another fruit-related series, uh, this time just focused on the, the deeper questions of fruit. Like, why is it called a pineapple if it looks nothing like an apple? Right? Think about that. And, yeah, not on pine trees. Maybe pine trees need to be renamed so it's less confusing. I don't know. Uh, it, which came first, the kiwi bird or the kiwi fruit? Was one named after the other? I don't know. Uh, if you want more details about the kiwi, uh, Ted is an expert. He knows almost everything. It's like his favorite food of all time or something, I don't know. Uh, and if oranges were a different color, would they be called something different? I don't know. However, I thought, you know, maybe we should talk about God instead of those things, all right? So uh, as interesting as those would be, maybe if you're interested in them, you know, I could be persuaded to do a podcast about fruits uh, called the, the, the fruits basket or the basket case, I don't know. But, um, you know, we have been really focusing these 40 days on who we need to be, and that has been awesome. Uh, I hope that you have grown a lot in understanding uh, more about what the Spirit can produce in you and how that can really benefit not only your life, but more importantly, God's kingdom. Uh, more importantly, the family of God. And, and I think that that's crucial, but in focusing on that, there is danger. There, there is a danger, and that's that we could focus too much on ourselves. When we look at the fruits of the Spirit, we can get, we can start to get wrapped up in me. I mean, that's what our world screams at us to do, is to be focused on me, to right. focus on who, who I am, right, instead of focusing on God. Right. And just like that song we sang, Good, Good Father, that we, we can skip getting our identity in God himself, and we can just focus on ourselves. Are you guys with me? Satan is capable of taking something that's great, something that's us being focused on the fruits of the Spirit, and twist it to become something it was never meant to be by God. And so today, we're going to take a step back, away from considering anything even having to do remotely with ourselves, and instead, we're going to focus wholly on God. Amen. Are you guys with me? Because we want to combat anything that Satan might be trying to do here. 
So if your heart is in a great spot, you know, you, the fruits of the Spirit have built you up. You're ready to come back in the power of the Spirit like Jesus himself. Amen. Go for it. I'm sure that this lesson on focusing on God can still help. And maybe, just maybe, you've gotten a little wrapped up in who you are. A little focused on the self here. And you need to take this step back with me. And we'll look at who is God. What is God really like? That's a huge question, right? And so I'm going to answer everything about who God is uh, right now. You've heard it here first. We're going to be here a few days. So no. Um, instead, we're going to look at just, just briefly uh, one scripture that I think really captures a lot of who God is. Now, in my pursuit of finding a scripture that could really do that, I was, I was thinking through over the course of scripture, is there a time that God tries to explain who he is to other people. And maybe you would have come to a different conclusion. You can get up and preach next week. Uh, maybe we have a time slot open. But what I came to is I thought time and time again in the Old Testament, when the Israelites were far off from God or maybe they were close, God would always bring them back to, I am the God who set you free as Israel from Egypt, right? That I am the God who freed you from slavery under Egypt. What a moment that that was for the Israelites. But there has to be something in that story. Something in those moments that God revealed himself to Moses, to the Israelites, to the Egyptians even. And so we're going to start at almost the start of that story where God reveals himself first to Moses. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. Okay. And we're going to read the whole chapter, and that is going to be our passage for today. So don't turn anywhere else or click anywhere else, wherever you might be. Exodus 3, that's where we're at, okay? And we're going to look at what, what is God like? And amen, he is the God who brought Israel out of Egypt, who is capable of bringing us out of our own oppressions out of our own slaveries that we might feel in our own lives now what jesus shared was that we are all slaves to sin amen and that we need to be brought out of that and so this applies to each and every one of us unless you haven't struggled with sin uh then this doesn't apply to you but okay. amen uh so let's start in exodus chapter 3 in verse 1 come on josh it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire. I don't know what other flames there are, but amen. <laughs> From within a bush, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. That's fair, right? I would be pretty intrigued by this bush as well. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Imagine how freaked out you'd be, right? This bush <laughs> yells your name at you. Wow. And Moses said, here I am. Or maybe he was cowering. I don't know. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And we're going to stop there. I love this setting, right? This is Moses right on the tail end of doing immeasurably wrong stuff, right? He murders this man uh, because he got angry. He looked around and then hid his body in the sand. Uh, he's probably not guilty, I don't know. And then what does he do when, when he knows that people hear about it? He runs away from Egypt. He runs away from the Israelites, runs away from everything that was going on in his life. For 40 years, he's out in Midian here. And that's where we come to our story. So this is not a Moses that's, you know, the most humble man on earth, right? This is a Moses that is struggling. 
This is a Moses that is, has run away from all of his problems. And maybe you can identify with that. Maybe you've said, man, I just want to, rave, want to run away from all my problems. All the things that are dragging me down, I just wish it was gone. I wish I didn't have to deal with it anymore, right? right? That is exactly what he had felt and was feeling for all this time. And then God appears to him and says, I am God, right? I'm the God of Israel, the God of all this stuff. And he's like, oh man, I, I don't deserve to even look at you. And amen, he did not, right? None of us deserve to be near God. Right? We all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen? And yet, God appeared to Moses in this moment. And he appears to us. He, he wants to have this relationship with us. I think that's so cool. But this is him setting up to reveal who he is. And I think that th this story is so special because it really shows God's heart. So he's coming from Israel being in Egypt for... 450 years a good chunk of that being them in slavery in Egypt and God is about to show us what his heart is really like he's going to open up and be vulnerable with Moses and we get the insight here how special is that that's so cool Amen. and as we talk here we're going to use a, a mnemonic to remember what God is like so we're going to look at four things that God is like and because he was in a burning bush, it's going to spell bush, okay? Nice. So right. we're going to look at the B, starting in verse 7. You guys with me? Yeah. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. We see that B here is for benevolent. God is benevolent. And what does that word mean? It means he's loving. He's merciful. He's kind. All he wants is good things to flow from him. Right? He wants to interact with his people, the Israelites, and that good things come. He wants nothing but good. Amen. That is what it means to be benevolent. And amen, God is benevolent. He looks at the hardship of his people, the hardship that Israelites have been experiencing, and he cares. He doesn't just look and say, oh, you know, it's fine. You guys will be out of it in no time. No. He looks and he says, I've heard the outcries, and I'm here to do something about it. That is the God that you and I serve. A benevolent God that looks on at suffering and oppression and says, I'm going to do something about it. I'm here to pull you out of that oppression, of that slavery. You know, when I think of an example of what it is to be benevolent, what it is to be merciful and loving, I can't help but think of my wife, Katie. Uh, and there's one story that I think is hilarious uh, that I'm going to share with you guys. We were driving one day, uh, and it was rainy. It was pouring outside. I don't know where we were going, but we were just driving along a street, and there's, there's a box sitting on the side of the road. And Katie starts freaking out. And I'm like, what? And she says, we have to pull over. We've got to pull over. I'm like, why? There might be a kitten in that box. <laughs> And it's raining, and this kitten is so sad, right? She's feeling compassion for an imaginary kitten, right? There could have been a kitten in that box. I don't know. We didn't pull over. I've got, I've got room to grow, guys. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to share. You know, 
Katie is benevolent. I didn't say I was. So, but amen. God is just like that, right? He looks on and sees the, the struggle, right? Katie looked at that box and said, there's a kitten struggling in that box, right? But God looks on and he knows, right? Katie, she doesn't know everything. She almost, almost there, but a lot of stuff, but God knows everything. Right. He looks on at you, at your life, at the, the things that you're wrestling with, just you. And he says, I care because I love you. That is our God. Amen. He is benevolent. If you were out in a box and it was raining, he's stopping the car. <laughs> All right? Amen. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and pretend that I know everything you've been through. I'm not going to pretend I know what it's like to be you. I don't pre I'm not going to pretend that I know what it is to feel the struggles you've felt, the oppressions that have been in your life, the hardships that you have had to experience. I, I don't know that stuff. And even if I, I knew the details about this or that, I have no idea how you really feel. And I can do my best to connect with you, to empathize and, and try and, and wonder what it is to be you, but I'm never going to get there. But God knows. God looks at you and he knows the hardship. He knows what it feels like. And if you need any more proof of this, just think about what Jesus went through. Right. That everything you're feeling, man, how real it is to you. All the, all the different oppressions and hardships that have happened in your life, man, Jesus went through it. He died on a cross, right? He experienced the weight of all of that for you. Not only for your sins, amen. Thank the Lord that he did that, right? But also that he could experience what it was like to be you. Experience the hardship that you have gone through. And so God looks on at you and says, I want to rescue you out of this hardship. I don't want things to be just terrible in your life. I want you to have what's awesome, have what's incredible, have all this and it's not gonna necessarily look how you might want it to look, but it's gonna be even better than that. That is the God that we serve. You know, in this story, what he promises to the Israelites is the promised land. He says, a land flowing of milk and honey. I love both milk and honey, so I really connect with this, right? Love them, man. And for them, it was this physical promised land. He says, oh, where the Canaanites and, and all those other ites, where they all live, right? That's for you guys. I have this set aside for my nation. But for us, what is our promised land? It's heaven. The God's prepared this incredible, perfect place for us to look forward to. We have heaven. And no matter what's going on here, it can't take that away, right? Right? Nothing in this world is capable of taking you away from the land that God has prepared for you. Amen. Nothing. There is not a thing. And you know what else is awesome? Because that would be enough in and of itself. But heaven isn't that far away. Because God designed a way to bring heaven here early in, in little pieces, in, in snapshots of what heaven is like. And if you look around, you're looking at it. We are God's design as not Heartland Church, but as the body of believers. Amen. That God's family is designed to bring heaven to earth early. It's almost like we're time travelers. <laughs> like we know what it's going to be like in the future. Okay. So we're bringing heaven now. Okay, I'm going to show you what heaven's like now. By the way that I love. By the way that I care. By the depth of my caring for you. And you for me. So we are here to bring heaven here early. So we don't have to wait, even though that heaven's going to be even better. Amen? Amen? We don't have to wait because we are designed to love one another in a depth that is like heaven. Amen. To care for one another. To treat one another as if we're already there. And yes, we are going to make mistakes. It's not a perfect picture yet. But it is at least that, a picture that we are supposed to be an image 
of what God has in store. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's keep reading for the word that's going to start with a U. Okay. We got the B, benevolent. Okay. Yeah. Starting in verse 11. It says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. For the you, God is unchanging. God is unchanging. And that is incredible, amen? Because he's been around for a minute, right? God, God's been around the block. And yet God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. That is the God that we serve. He doesn't change. He doesn't, you know, today I don't feel like being so loving. You know, uh, well, today's a good day for me, but tomorrow, uh, I'm not going to encourage them at all. It's going to be terrible tomorrow, right? God isn't like that. He is unchanging. And you know, I was trying to think of a, of a great example uh, of this, and I think a lot of us here are a good example, but the one I'm going to pick today is Scott Manneman. Uh, okay. There's Scott, Scott over there, uh, just cleared of COVID, no COVID and Scott. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had lunch with Scott today, and, and you know, he, he welcomed me into his home uh, just so encouraging. And every time you interact with Scott, it's the same. Doesn't matter how his day's been going. Doesn't matter what else is going on in his life. He's like, oh, welcome, brother, you know? Yeah. And he's, he's just the same Scott, yesterday, today, and forever, it feels like. And so, and amen, even Scott has, has changed, I'm sure. But th that's the same attitude that God has. That, you know, despite everything going on with God, and he hurts all the time from all this different stuff. And yet, he's the same. He's not going to treat you any different based on how he feels or what's going on that week or that day or whatever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. That is the God that we serve. And you know, people in the world, situations, they change all the time. Right. I mean, even just thinking of the COVID restrictions. I'm pretty sure they probably changed multiple times during this lesson, right? <laughs> like, it, it, it feels like all the time things are just changing. Situations are new and just happen in the blink of an eye. And then just like that, they're gone. Or sometimes not just like that, they're gone, right? We have no clue what's going to happen with all this COVID stuff. We thought at the very start, back in March, oh, it'll just be a couple weeks. All right. Well, <laughs> here we are, right? right? We had no clue. Because situations change. Right. You can't count on those things. Right. And who knows? Maybe COVID's gone tonight. Maybe it's gone tomorrow. Maybe oh. it's worse. Who? None of us are ever going to be able to tell right. till it's already happened. And yet God doesn't change. Right. In a world full of stuff that changes all the time, nothing you can depend on, there's God. And so God, we have to remember, is unchanging. No matter what else is going on in the world, he will always love you. He will always be the God who brought Israel out of Egypt and will always be the God that cares about his people enough to bring them out of their own slavery and sin. Amen? Amen. All right, let's keep reading. Come on. Verse 16 says, go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers and God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 
feel like I've heard something like that a couple <laughs> times here. Appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, they shortened it for, for Egypt, you know, don't want to make it too complicated, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels them. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. For us here, God is strong. God is strong, right? He knew, you know, for me to get you out of Israel, it's going to take a mighty hand. So I'll stretch mine, right? He's like, maybe that'll be enough, Moses. What do you think? Maybe that'll be enough, Pharaoh. And amen it is. Spoiler alert, God gets them out, right? God pulls them out. And it's incredible the way he does it. And man, just thinking of all the stuff that happens that lead to finally the Pharaoh saying, just get out of Egypt. We're done having you guys, right? God is strong. There is nothing that stands up to God. He is powerful beyond comparison. We cannot muster enough together to even understand how strong God is, right? right? And nothing in Egypt could have even come close. And Egypt at the time was the pinnacle of the known world. Right. They were on top. It didn't get any better than Egypt. It didn't get any stronger than Egypt. It didn't get any more techno technologically advanced than Egypt. And yet they were nothing compared to God. The same is true of so much of today. Nothing stands a chance. You know, when I was trying to picture what, what would this look like, uh, Tim helped me out. We had our staff went out to a field and we just went out there together and prayed. Uh, we prayed through a few Psalms and prayed from our hearts uh, to God. And it was an incredible time. But as we looked out in this field, no idea where it is. So ask Tim if you're <laughs> curious. But um, we looked out at this field and there's all this grass uh, that was really high. It really needed to be mowed. And... Um, but in, in amongst all this grass that was swaying back and forth in the wind, there was a tree, this huge tree just right in the middle. And I was looking at that and just thinking, man, this grass can't, can't hold a candle to this tree, right? right? The grass can do whatever. It can grow some roots. It can, can grow really, really tall. Uh, my lawn grows really, really faster than everybody else's, I feel like. And... <laughs> And so it, it, it can get tall, but it's never going to be anything like that tree. Right. That grass could not ever, if it did its best, do a thing to that tree, right? It's just going to sway back and forth. And that's it. It's going to like maybe touch the tree. And the tree's like, I don't even feel anything. Similarly, the whole world is that grass and then God's the tree. God is strong on a level that it doesn't even compare, right? The world has nothing that can compare even remotely to God. No matter how strong the world may look, no matter how strong the situation may feel, no matter how firm the, the hold of sin might feel in your life, it doesn't hold a candle to God. It does not hold a candle to God's strength. No matter how strong the grip feels like it is on your life, God's grip is stronger. Because it's not even close. And I think we've all been there where we felt, man, I can't escape my sin. I can't move past it. I can't overcome it. I feel lost. I feel hopeless. In reality, it's the opposite. Your sin can't possibly 
amount to as much as God. Right. Your sin can't be anything close to as strong as God. Right. You know, I think this is how Jesus put it in John chapter 10. He said in verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. It doesn't matter how strong the world feels. It can't snatch you out of God's hand. That's right. God's hand is mighty. It's strong. God is strong. And nothing that we ever do, nothing that anything could happen in the world, it doesn't matter. Because God's stronger than that. God's bigger than that. God's greater than that. So, amen. God is strong. Amen. Let's close out the chapter here. Verse 21. It says, And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any women or woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Our final word to describe God is holy. God is holy. And you know, I think that this section is crazy. It is insane what really happens here. Because these guys don't just, you know, please leave, is, is what Egypt ends up, ends up saying to them. But what God's saying is, they're not just going to do that. They're, they're going to pay you to leave. Right? They're going to say, what can we give you so you'll leave? Okay? Like, uh, do you want my silver and gold? Take it. Take it and leave. I, whatever it takes. Right? It's not just that they're going to walk on out of there. They're going to walk on out of there having pillaged the greatest nation on the planet without trying. <laughs> wow, right? That's, that doesn't make sense. That defies logic. Yeah. And that's the same capacity of how different God is from the world. Right. And that's what it is that he's holy, that he's set apart, that he's different, that everything in the world look, works like this, and then God's like, eh, I make the rules. <laughs> you don't get to tell me how I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, right? And God, that's what it is for him to be holy. He's nothing like the world. And the perfect example of this is Jesus himself, right? right? What is our world all about? Man, especially here in America, it's you have to earn all this stuff, right? Like it, it, if I'm going to pay you money, you got to do this stuff. And that makes sense in, in terms of governing. That's not how God works, right? God says, I forgave you before you even did it, right? I forgave you knowing you would continue to mess up, to make mistakes. And you know what? I'm not even going to make you pay for it. I'm going to pay for it. That's how different God is from the world. He doesn't love the way the world loves. He doesn't care the way the world cares. He doesn't interact the way the world interacts. He's God. And he's holy. He's set apart. He's totally different. And so we can't understand God in worldly terms. We have to remember him as completely set apart from what the world is. He does not function the way we would imagine based on being raised in this kind of a world. And amen for that. Our world is ruthless. It, it's a kick-you-while-you're-down sort of mentality. And all too often, that happens in all of our lives. And we start to impose those expectations on God himself. But it's the opposite. That God said, I'm nothing like that, to the point that I will pay the price for what you've done. You're not going to have to pay that price. I'm going to pay the price. That's the God that we serve because Jesus went to the cross for you and me for our sin for our mistakes that we sometimes feel like are stronger than God himself and he said I already paid for that because I don't work the way that your world works that is the God that we pray to that is the God we sing to he is 
awesome. And when we sing these songs, don't let them ring hollow. Remember what our God is all about. God is so much more than we could ever wrap our heads around. Amen? We could never imagine everything about who God is. But we can remind ourselves of just how awesome he really is. We can remind ourselves, man, this is the God who brought Israel out of Egypt. This is the God who's allowed me to be brought out of my own sin, out of the life that I constructed for myself that's built on, on sin and, and darkness. And he can change that, transform it to be light, to be something incredible. So let's remember that God is benevolent. He's unchanging. He's strong. And he's holy. And let's live like it. Yeah. To God be the glory. Yeah. At this time, we're going to pray. Uh, and then we can take our communion. Uh, we'll do a song during that. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are such an incredible God. And that you do care about us so much. And that, that will never change, Father. That that will never go away. That you love us to our core. And Father, that, that you are willing with your mighty hand to take us out of the lives that we ourselves have chosen before we knew it was so bad, Father. And, and bring us to your promised land. That we can live with you, even though we don't deserve it, even though we, we could never deserve it, Father, but you paid the price for us. And I pray that we never take that for granted. Or if we ever do, Father, that, that we could realize it and change. Father, we love you and we look to you as our everything. For all this, you're something. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing Hallelujah, What a Savior. Months 
is our garage sale for missions, which will be happening next Saturday, the 19th. So a few details. I sent them out through your small group leaders, but a few details. It will be next Saturday from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Setup starts at 6 p.m. So how this is gonna work? We 6 a.m. 6 a.m. <laughs> Just kidding. 6 p.m. on Friday. No, 6 a.m. Setup starts. But how it will work is every small group is doing their own little grouping of tables out there. So it's like a flea market, flea market kind of type thing, right? So everybody, every small group that's participating needs to have somebody from their small group during setup and during the whole garage sale. So what you need is at least one person per participating small group to be there during the setup times, which will also be this Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m. after midweek. And then Friday, you can also bring stuff up to start setting up from 7 to 9 p.m. So Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m. after midweek, this Friday from 7 to 9 p.m., you can start bringing stuff up. Everything has to be priced. So when you're setting up on the tables, you can price it then, but everything has to be priced when you're setting up. And I heard the winning small group gets a trophy. I mean, if Anna wants a trophy, we'll give her a trophy. It's fine. Whatever. It's all for missions. So I mean, whatever. we can do it. But we're all raising money for missions. So go through your homes, your garages, get rid of all the junk that you've been purging anyway right now because it's somebody else's treasure, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that will happen. And again, at least one person from your small group. So that's why it's super important to coordinate with your small group leader who's going to be here when for all of that. Um, if there's any questions, you can ask your small group leader or you can come talk to me about it. Send me a text. Um, but we want to we want to do this and, and send a lot of money to missions. Um, then, starting next week, next Sunday, we will start meeting on Sunday mornings again. Woo! Yay! So we will get out more details to you about what that's going to look like and how that's going to work later this week. But we will start meeting together again on Sunday mornings um, at the building at ten. Oh, well, we'll get all that information out and. Please check with your small group if you're not sure when you're filling the food pantry. Um, that's been going great over there. You guys are super generous and super awesome with all of that. So um, we love being able to do that for the community. So um, next week it's our group. So, yep. And I think that's all. Amen. Well, let's stay in. We're going to close out with Rise Up, O Men of God. Rise up, O men of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God. His kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of Rise up, O men of God, the church for you doth wait. Her strength unequal to her task, rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where his feet have trod. Son of man, rise up, O men of God. Rise up, O men of God. Amen. We are dismissed for some fellowship.